Oud Sheva, Israel National TV, and Or Olam, the Center for Biblical Zionism, present Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel. Live from the heart of Israel, welcome to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Shalom and welcome to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Now I got a joke. You all know the story about the American, the Brit, and the Israeli. They're in a safari in Africa and they're captured by cannibal headhunters and they're taken in before they're going to be cooked up. The chief says, you have one last request. I know this could go in a lot of different ways right now. And the American says, well, I'd like a steak. So they cut up a zebra and give him a steak. And the Brit says, well, I like to smoke me pipe. And they give him his pipe, and he smokes his pipe. And the Israeli says, I want you to punch me in the face as hard as you can. And the chief says, well, what kind of request is that? And he says, that's my request. Punch me as hard as you can. So the chief punches him. He immediately takes out his gun, shoots the chief, the hunters, and they're all running away. And as they're running, the Brit and the Americans say, if you had a gun, why don't you just shoot him to begin with? And the Israeli says, what, are you crazy? And have the United Nations call me the aggressor? <laughs> <laughs> you see, we're, we're in very interesting times in Israel right now. We've just, about a week ago, started a ceasefire with Hamas, a terrorist organization that is bent on our destruction, that has committed countless terrorist attacks against the Jewish people, whose entire purpose in the world is to destroy the Jewish state. So we have a ceasefire with them right now. Now, the Minister of Defense, Barak, was being interviewed for the far-left newspaper Haaretz by Ari Shavit. And in this interview, he really confessed that he's got no illusions about what Hamas is. He knows what they're about. He knows that there's no making peace with them. But what was his rationale for signing a, a, a cessation of fire, a ceasefire with Hamas? A Iranian proxy that's bent on our destruction, what was his rationale? That if we are going to have a military offensive, if we're going to be able to have a war, well, we need to have the entire world see that Hamas has attacked us. So we're justified in responding. So basically, 
We know right now that Hamas is doing the best that they can, very rapidly increasing their arms cachet, their weapons, training their army to destroy us in the future. We know all of this, but we're not defeating them right now because we're waiting for them to get stronger so when they attack us, we can tell the world that they started it. Does that make any sense? It's always about this, this international approval. This quest for international approval has been Israel's primary strategy from the very beginning. I mean, it makes sense. It's practical. It's pragmatic. I mean, we're such a small people. It makes sense that we want to get the world behind us, and we want to prove to the world that we're the good guys. I mean, that was the base philosophy behind the disengagement. We wanted to show the world that we would give up everything. We would disengage to the 67 borders. We would give up to the terrorists everything that we held dear. We would uproot Jews from their homes. We'd put them in tents. We would do all of this for nothing. And then we would prove to the world through this peace offering, how good we are and how bad they are. And our politicians promised that then, if one rocket falls onto Israel, then we're going to be able to attack the terrorists and defeat them with the world behind us. And since the disengagement, over 8,000 rockets have been shot onto Israel. The Hamas, a terrorist organization, has been elected to lead their government. There are more guns, missiles, and rockets in Gaza than ever before in history. And yet still the world looks at Israel and says, Israel is the cause of the problems in the Middle East. The same happened in the Oslo Accords. The same happened with Camp David. Our leaders were ready to sacrifice our heritage and our security. And the world still blamed us for the Antifada. This life philosophy is so embedded in our Jewish superconsciousness, it stems all the way back to the sin of the spies. When the spies went into Israel, they came back with an evil report. They say, we will not be able to go against the nations living there, for they are stronger than we. Living in fear of the nations, living in fear of what the world will say, has brought Israel to where we are today with Shihab missiles pointed towards us, the Hezbollah in the north, the Hamas in the south, living in fear of what the world will say. Putting the world's opinion before Israel's interests has been the source of all of our pain. And it's time that the Jewish people in the land of Israel stand up and we do what's right, and we put Israel's interests before the world's opinion, and we tell the world that we're here because we deserve to be here, to act with the courage and conviction, knowing our right to our homeland, to act with moral faith, moral clarity, and courage, and to do what's just and what's right, to ensure the future of the Jewish people in the land of Israel, and to ensure the future of the Jewish people around the world. The time has come to do what's right. Really, where has all of this practicality gotten us? The pragmatism, the secu where, where's the security? We were all hoping that all of these backbending measures, Gaza, where would the security be? It's nowhere that I see. I know that Iran is developing nuclear weapons. They have their Shihab missiles. Number three, they're pointed directly at Israel. Their proxy armies of the Hezbollah and the Hamas are prepared to attack. Forget them, Al-Qaeda, the Islamic Jihad, and Egypt, Syria, come on, who's, who's kidding? If there is a war, they will mo very happily jump on the bandwagon. Where's all of the security? You know, it was these times that the Prophet was talking about. Therefore, hear the word of Hashem. You scoffers who rule this people, you have entered the covenant with death, with the grave you've made an agreement. We have made lies our refuge and falsehood our hiding place. Your covenant with death will be annulled, your agreement with the grave shall not stand. And Yonatan ben Uziel, he's a commentator, a famous commentator, he elaborates on this. He says, we have made a covenant with murderers and peace with terrorists. This is thousands of years ago. We've made a covenant with murders and peace with terrorists. Then the plague of the enemy will afflict us like a flooded river. He goes on to say the treaty with the terrorists will not last. The truth is, though, that it doesn't really take a prophet to realize this. It just takes a leader with basic sense and courage and conviction to see the situation really for what it is. Tonight's show is about the future state of Israel. And the future state of Israel needs leaders like Yehoshua and Kalev, like Joshua and Caleb, who went into Israel, saw the giants, and came back with courage and faith. They said, We shall surely go up and inherit the land, for we can indeed take her. 
Halevin Yehoshua, they saw the miracles of Hashem. They saw the exodus from Egypt. They saw the splitting of the sea. They saw the downfall of the world empire. They ate from the manna of heaven. They knew that God had brought them this far and he wasn't going to leave them behind. And today we need a leader that sees the miracles of Israel that sees the miracle of the ingathering of the exile that's happening before our eyes, that sees the miracle of the Independence Day War, where a group of ill-armed Holocaust survivors defeated the entire Arab world in professional armies, who sees the miracle of the Six-Day War, who sees the miracle of our life and our success in Israel and realizes that it's God's hand that's brought us this success. We need a leader who sees the miracle that God has brought us this far and that God's not going to leave us behind. The future Jewish state will have a leader that will bring Jewish values to our judicial system. We'll have a Jewish leader who will give Jewish education to every child who wants to learn about their heritage. We'll have a Jewish leader who will encourage Aliyah who will embrace Jews from all walks of life, from all four corners of the earth with open arms, saying, come and make your home in Israel. We need a Jewish leader who will stand in front of the United Nations and finally speak in the name of Hashem. Tonight, we have the honor of having a religious spiritual leader with us. His entire life has been dedicated to Torah Israel, Eretz Israel, and Am Israel. He's the spiritual leader, the founder of Chazon Yechezkel, a synagogue in the Arab-occupied section of the old city of Jerusalem. He's a prolific writer, the commentator of Mei Menuchot, a commentary on the Tosfod. He's dedicated his entire life to bringing an authentic Jewish voice to Jews around the world. And tonight, we believe that he embodies a vision of what the future Jewish state should be and could be. So please, everyone, welcome Rabbi Nachman Gahan. Rabbi, thank you so much for being with us. <laughs> Rabbi Gahana, this week is your 46th anniversary. You and your wife made Aliyah 46 years ago to Yerushalayim. <laughs> Permit me, Ari, to, to correct you. I never said I made Aliyah. Aliyah made me. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it did make me nervous and irritable. It made me a better Jew. So you've been here for 46 years. You've lived through the, the most exciting Jewish history in the past 2,000 years. How has your perception of the state of Israel changed over the time that you've been here? It's a big question. How much time do I have? <laughs> uh, 2,000 years? <laughs> Actually, my, my perception or my uh, opinion about Medina Tisrael was forged the first week that I came to Israel. I use the words forged because not formed, Forge is something which is some, comes out of fire, right? Something which is very powerful. Uh, the story is, my wife and I came, I think it was Monday, uh, 1962, on the 24th day of Sivan. Uh, we took a, a Sheirut a service to Yerushalayim, and it was the most magnificent car I ever saw in my life. This is 1962. There's barely any food in the country, nothing to wear here. This big stretch black DeSoto limousine. So since I'm here already two days, I already have the right to have a little chutzpah, right? I'm an Israeli already. I asked the driver, where'd you get such a car? And he said to me, I have two sons. I enrolled them in the missionary school in Yafo, and I got this car. I said, no, this can't be. This is not the heritage that I came to. In my view, everyone in Israel was a tzaddik. It can't be that this man driving this car got it because he put two children in the missionary school. But it's that way. That's and intuition. Anyway, yeah, tuition. Uh, probably cost less than what the tuition costs today in America anyway. Uh, I was in a very unhappy state, that's the truth. So we came to Yerushalayim, we came to Echel Shlomo. Echel Shlomo was the seat of the chief rabbin at the time, and also the court of the high religious, Beit Adin Rabbani Agadol, high religious court and it was open to the public. So we came in, and it was a case, a deliberation between a brother and a sister over the, uh, the, uh, over the will of the mother. And he says to her, you never loved mama, you just wanted her money. And she says, you hypocrite, you only spoke against mama. And I'm looking at my wife, she's looking at me. 
He says, is this the place that we came to? An hour ago, we have this driver of the car, and we have this brother and sister. This is not, we were not happy, not that, that day. But Hashem has his ways. Everything is a setup. We came out from the building. We went to Uchov, Betzalel, beautiful new building, Betam. Knocked on the door. A man comes out and he says, okay. I said, Anachno Olim Chadashim, in my best Hebrew, we're new immigrants. So, come, I'd like to show you something. We came into the building. He took us upstairs to the third floor. It was a long hall with the rooms off the side. At the end of the room, end of the corridor, it was bars like a cell. It was a cell. I walked closer and I saw there was a bed made perfectly military style. You could take a, a coin and drop it off. There was a book with a bookmark inside placed on a night table. There was slippers placed underneath the bed perfect, exact. And the man says, this was the cell of Adolf Eichmann. Eichmann was hung a week before, was hanged a week before we came to Israel. I remember they used to fly in the deliberations of the trial of Eichmann. Eichmann was the man that planned and implemented the destruction of Hungarian Jewry and other Jews. Uh, and he was caught by the, by the Shin Bet or the Mossad in Argentina and brought there to Israel. And he was hanged, as I said, a week before we came. I remember we used to see the films, they used to fly them into America. Uh, we were glued, people were glued to the television from 6 to 6.30 every evening to see the story unfolding of the Shoah, of witnesses. It was just, just something. And the whole Shoah came in front of us. And here was I standing in front of the cell of Eichmann. And the bed was made perfect. He made the bed. And he put the bookmark in the book as if he's coming back. And he put the shoes underneath the bed. Because that's order, Nung. That's order. That's what it has to be. And I said, Bani Shalom, now you understand. This foolish taxi driver and the foolish brother and sister, that's not Israel. That's the people I have this all the time. Medina Israel is something. An entity which can speak for the entire Jewish people. It can bring an arch murderer to trial in Yerushalayim. And at least in some way, to find some kind of comfort to what happened to us. And that's Medina Tisrael. Whatever it is, it's Medina, our Medina. It's the greatest thing we have. We have to caress it. We have to build it up. We have to make it, bring out the potential of what it can be. The potential is, is enormous, Medina Tisrael. We have wonderful, the greatest people in this country. And, uh, and I am very optimistic about the future. Which so what? what do you think about the future state of Israel? How important is Aliyah? How important is that for the future state of Israel? Aliyah? Well, I, I've been around a long time, right? And I've seen a lot of things. I've seen a lot of people that have come here that have every reason to remain and be successful. And other people that don't have, don't have the basic requirements of, of being in Eretz Israel. And yet the ones that I thought could make it here return, go back, and those that can't make it. It seems Aliyah is something in the neshama of a person. It's something which reaches out from inside of the, of the Jew. And uh, there are a lot of good Jews out there in Chutzaret have no intention at all of coming here. There, there's something else. I think to, you have to be invited to the palace of the king. You don't just come. Remember the year that I came to Israel, uh, Without my wife and I, would have been 675 people from North America. We made it 677. It was a good year for wine, a terrible year for Aliyah. Uh, but as things happen, Hashem has His plan. The way I see it, that in the first, in the first level of Aliyah came people from the underprivileged countries, from uh, North Africa, from the Muslim countries. Then came the second wave of Aliyah, then came from the Soviet Union and more. I'll say it's a more educated than Leah. And the third one to come will be those that have to foot the bill. That's the Jews from America. And it's going to happen. It's going to come. And everything is in its, in its place. Uh, there's a Midrash called, a book of Midrashim, which is called the Yalkut Ruveni. Speak about the future. And when I saw this, I was like uh, taken aback. 
and told it to one of my friends, he turned green. And I told it to him. It says as follows, in the time to come, future time, now the future is today, that how much future is left in front of us. Hashem is going to bring the Jews from Chutz Laaretz to Eretz Israel and make them wealthy beyond all human estimation. It says, all right. <laughs> That's before income tax. <laughs> And then the wealth of the world is going to come up. The Medrash says, Namala Anamel Shel Yafo. There used to be a, 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 a port. port in Yafo. Yeah. And what about the Jews and Eretz? What about us? The Yalkut says, Hashem is going to give us a different kind of a physicality, a more spiritual kind of a physicality, open up the earthly Gan Eden for us, and reveal to us the secrets of the Torah. Now these guys were driving on the Jaguars, and they had the three swimming pools, and they had Salia and, and Manana, whatever it is. They said, we also want to come in. We also want to hear about the secrets of the Torah. Shem says, no, that's for my people. I had to do, do up, I had to uh, make up with Kupat Cholim. I had to go to the army. That's for my people in Eretz Israel. That's more or less what's going to be. Uh, that's the Mizgeret. That's the framework, how we color it in. Those are the details which we don't know yet. So if we had one message in the last two minutes that we have, a message that needs to go from Israel to the entire world, a message that the whole world needs to hear, that's why Hashem brought us back, was to be a light unto the nations, what would that message be? The message would be, Shema Yisrael Hashem Alakein Hashem Machad. But until we get there, we have an immediate problem, which I think uh, I would like to, uh, I'd like to, uh, to make this uh, public. Uh, we're worried about Iran. That's the immediate problem. I'm not worried about Iran. Because there's a medrash now. A medrash was written over 2,000 years ago that deals with what's happening today. It's as if it's a photograph of what's happening today. For your permission, I'd like to read it to you. The year that the Mashiach is going to appear. All the nations of the world are at each other's necks. Melech Paras. Paras is Iran, right? I remember this written over 2,000 years ago. It said Paras, even 30 years ago, Paras is not a player and not a major league player. Melech Paras, Midgarebe Melech Arabi. He's going to make war on Melech Arabi. Who's Melech Arabi? You can take your choice. There are 22 Arab nations that they can pick on. Let's say it's Saudi. Olech Melech Arabi La Aram is going to go to Aram. Aram is usually associated with either Iraq or, Ra or Syria. Litol Eitzah Mehem. To ask an Eitzah, an advice, how to deal with, with Iran, with Paras. Ochazeh Melech Paras Machib et Kol Olam. Paras are going to come, going to destroy the world, meaning the world order. They want to destroy the world. Ochol Amot Olam, all the nation of the world. Mitrashim et Pahalim, Venoflim al Paneim. The nation of the world are totally, totally, how do you say, they're out of control and they're walking back and forth and they're saying, who's going to save us? So what happens? That's the goyim. The Israel, the Jewish people, us, are also very, very nervous and very tense, very fearful. Where should we go? Where should we come? And then Hashem says to the Jewish people, Banai, don't be afraid. All things which I have done, I've done only for you. Why are you afraid? The time of your, time of your redemption has arrived. Not like the first redemption from Egypt, which there was there was subjugation afterwards. The final redemption will be total, total freedom from Shibut Malchiot. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you. This is our season finale. It's the last time we had, we said, what Meet the Street could we possibly do with the season finale? So we went to Yoni Kempinski, the director of Israel National TV, and he said, guys, I got your back, don't worry. I'm going to put forth this amazing final video to give the world a chance 
that never saw Tuesday Night Live to get a full body experience of what it's all about. So finally, for all those that have never seen, you have a chance to feel all of Tuesday Night Live this last year. Please enjoy. I'm just so grateful to our creator that he let everything go so smoothly and so wonderfully for our first show. There's something magnificent that's happening in Israel. Instead of Judaism being a religion of individuals, we're becoming a nation again. And as one nation in the land of Israel, a Jewish voice can now go out to the entire world. A new movement is happening in Israel. A new Jewish music, a new Jewish culture, a new Jewish experience is here. And Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem is meant to bring that truth and that Jewish experience to the world. Live from the heart of Israel, welcome to Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. The selfless people of Jerusalem. 22 programs ago, Arutz Sheva, Israel National TV, and the Oralam Center for Biblical Zionism jointly launched the Jerusalem-based Jewish TV show, Tuesday Night Live in Jerusalem. Tuesday nights in Jerusalem are never going to be the same again. Because finally, Jerusalem is what it was always meant to be. A light for the entire world. Tuesday Night Live celebrates the wonders of Israel, the beauty of Judaism, and the experience of life in Jerusalem. Hosted by Ari Abramowitz and Jeremy Gimpel, Tuesday Night Live is filmed with a live studio audience in a large downtown Jerusalem auditorium in the Hechal Shlomo building. The show features a variety of guests. Some talk, some sing, some do both, and everyone uplifts and brings smiles to our faces. The same Torah that commands the Sabbath commands us to live in Israel. This is the end of the line. I'm here. I'm never going to leave this place for the rest of my life. We're going to continue to plow that land. We're going to build another hundred settlements every day. And we're going to make this land ours. This is not going to happen again, so enjoy it while you can. A pocket? Does the zero pound baby need a pocket? A zero pound baby has neither arms or legs. It certainly doesn't need a pocket. Jonathan is, as his name sounds, Yehoh Nathan, God's gift. He's an amazing man who has stayed alive against all odds to give us, the Jewish people, the opportunity to come together, to show unity, and to redeem ourselves by redeeming him. Everyone here can do something. Power's imprisonment, in a way, imprisons every single one of us. Every loss and every hard situation has something hidden in it, something that is waiting to be born from it. When I was a little girl in Bag and Belden, I knew that we the Jewish people would survive. How did I know that? Because I was nurtured under milk of Emona, under milk of faith. So I think ultimately the challenge is how we share the experience of what Judaism is all about with more and more Jews. And I think the most important thing is learning how to clean yourself out so you actually can hear Hashem talking to you. Because I believe that Hashem is talking to every single one of us all the time. I choose Judaism. It's not something that was there's no matrix that I'm stuck in. It's nothing that I you don't want. It's all me. And my connection is now by choice, and I want to be close to you, God. We're not who we are. Our essence is not who we are right now. 
but our essence is is what we want recreate the scene with our families reunite in song and prayer and a voice said put your faith in me safely through the desert i will lead you so in the year 135, 136, this garment became a zecher. It became a remembrance. It became a little four-cornered garment that we would attach the fringes to and hide it underneath our Gentile apparel so that we could remember the commandment of tzitzit but without getting killed for it. I remember the Rambo movie, Eye of the Tiger. You've got to have Eye of the Tiger. I said, if the Hamas has 95, grade 95 dark side faith, to win, we have to have grade 96, light side faith and better. And that's what the war is all about. I'm Yisrael Chai, Oda B'Enu Chai, I'm Yisrael Chai, Israel is like a magnet that attracts the best and the brightest of the Jewish people. And Ari and I wanted to find those sparks all over Israel, get them on stage, and let them share their message with the world. The guests that we have on Tuesday Night Live really sum up the message that Jewish people and non-Jews all around the world need to hear out of Israel. We had some rabbis come and explain that the Torah is directly from God and with intellectual, rational thought and investigation, we can see that and learn it and really connect with the Torah. And not only that, but the land of Israel is a mirror that God has given us and the Jewish people need to return home and we've had leaders and speakers and rabbis explaining the uh, critical importance of the Jewish people coming home to the land of Israel. If there are religious leaders, spiritual leaders, educators, stand-up comedians, professors, all of the people that we thought had a Jewish message that the world needed to hear, we brought them on and gave them a platform to share that light with the world. And really all of the different rabbis from all of the different perspectives come together to make one picture that is really a picture of light coming out of Israel emanating to the whole world. That's the purpose. It's a beautiful cold winter day here in Jerusalem. One of the highlights of Tuesday Night Live occurs on the streets of Jerusalem. Every week, Ari and Jeremy hit the streets and come back with funny, emotional, uplifting, and inspiring words from the Jews and also the non-Jews they meet in the streets of the Jewish nation's capital. And now, meet the street with Ari and Jeremy. Eat the barakas of Jerusalem. 200 years of barakas. Barakas that are 200 years old. This is the most beautiful thing in the world. It's fresh. It's only 200 years. I'm Israel over here. Now the story of Geulah. And who is not here, just fast-fast a little history. Why on earth would you leave Los Angeles, risk your life to serve in the Israeli army? Are you out of your mind? My mom thinks so. Polish man from Poland. A Polish man. Yeah. Okay. Hasidim. Do you think any Polish men are dressed up like an Ethiopian guy? Yeah. Uh, I hope so. I hope so too. If we have a Munah and we're together, then I'm Yisrael Chai and here we are. Chesed is kindness, is compassion. You go up to the average dude in the street, you say, what's your favorite mitzvah? He says, I love doing kindness and compassion to everyone in the world. I don't know in I don't know Are you Jewish? Yeah, sure. Do you like being Jewish? Sure. Do you want to marry a Jewish woman? Sure. We keep going on, you know what I'm saying? And like, I think that's what it is. It's like, it's like God is on our side and like, we know what we're doing and we're like united in a way that like, no other nation is. Uh, have you ever been interviewed before as you're walking up the street? Is it Purim, or are you serving in the Israeli army? Look, so we're here with Hametz, discarded on the streets of Yerushalayim. We're going to ask a few questions. Do you feel rejected? <laughs> we have to ask you a few questions about Pesach. Mitzvah gedola, lihiot besimcha, lihiot besimcha tamid. <laughs> Walk on this land, take this land, cultivate this land, produce it, do, do
do what you're supposed to do. Obey his commandments and be strong. What do you like the most about the Israeli soldiers? They shoot so cool. We wanted to share the Jewish people with the entire world, so every show we went out to the streets and we asked just the people that we met on the street about the topic of that show, if it was about the army, if it was about Judaism, if it was about Zionism, and just hearing the beauty and the wisdom of the Jewish people that live in Jerusalem, the tourists that come here, was amazing. It gives us a chance to like fool around with people, to joke with people, and to like share ourselves with them and then share that love with the world. Oh, for me it was like a frustration. A frustration when you're walking through the streets of Jerusalem, standing in line at the post office, having a conversation with the guy in front of you, and he teaches you the most beautiful wisdom you've ever heard in your entire life. And that's just what happened on the streets of Jerusalem, and I'm frustrated that the world doesn't get to see the real voice of the Jewish people, what is really happening okay, here in Jerusalem. And that is my, that's what really gave us the idea. We had to share that. Do you speak English? I'm from Jamia El Uds. Min Fain Inte. I'm from El Uds. El Uds? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Uh, falafel shawarma. <laughs> Normally you walk through the streets, you don't talk to everybody you see. <laughs> but here we meet the streets, we stop everybody, we ask them questions that uh, normally you wouldn't ask a person. And, and you really get to see how the Jewish people uh, feel and, and, and what their values are. And it's inspiring for me. The voice that's coming out of Israel to the world is one of a, tr a lot of secularism and pragmatism. And that's not really the voice of the Jewish people. And we wanted to share the beauty of the Jewish people with the whole world. And so Tuesday Night Live is ending its first season and going off on vacation, but the mission of Tuesday Night Live continues every day. Each and every one of us can spread the light of the land of Israel, the nation of Israel, and the Torah of Israel. Last week, we were privileged to bring in 70, over 70 of our fellow brothers and sisters, really the student Jewish leaders from throughout America, who have decided with courage and clarity to come here to Israel, to Jerusalem, to spend their summer. And they're working their future fields and their future professions, making the relationships and the connection and the experience, which will hopefully lay the groundwork for their future Aliyah and life here in Israel. Jeremy and I have been so inspired and filled with hope as we've spent time with them, as we spent this past Shabbat with them, to see that these indeed are the future leaders of the Jewish people. And believe me when I say that there is hope. And I want to tell you that, you know, sometimes we start actually believing that we need these titles and degrees before our name to actually accomplish something great in the world. But if there's one thing that our Torah and our rich tradition teaches us, it's that greatness and leadership comes from within. And we're so eager and excited for the next future leadership of the Jewish people that is coming out of Israel right here. So Tuesday Night Live now is ending for the year, but as the cameras pan the audience and the world sees what's happening in Israel, they're able to take part in the greatest revolution of all times. The ingathering of the exiles, the restoration of the nation of Israel to our ancient homeland, proof that the Torah is true and that God has kept his promise throughout all of history against all odds. We've put our faith in the nations of the world. We've put our faith in different ideals, communism and capitalism, 
it's about time that we put our faith in the Torah because the Torah has been true through and through from the very beginning to the very end. If we had one message that we would want to leave the world with, it was like Rav Nachman Kahana said, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Shalom from Jerusalem. <laughs>